Welcome back to the wastewater stream for the EOCP conference. Um, our next presentation is uh, about saving energy at wastewater facilities through low and no cost opportunities. Our presenter on this one is Wendy Walby and she is a water wastewater engineer at Cascade Energy. She has 17 years of experience in energy efficiency, wastewater treatment, plant design, reuse, and wastewater service charges. She has worked as a consultant and a regulator and worked for a large wastewater agency. She graduated from California's Polytech State University and San Lucius, I'm not sure, about the, uh, Abispo, with a BS and MS in civil and environmental engineering. She's a registered professional engineer in Idaho and California. I'm going to uh, pass on over to her. Oh, damn, I keep doing this. Use the chat line and the email tab on the top of your screen for questions, and uh, we'll get started now. Wendy, you ready? Yeah, great. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today for this session. Um, I love working with folks in our industry because you guys do such a great job and you're passionate about your work. Um, I think we all appreciate the industry a little bit more from COVID. And so, um, yeah, just happy to be here today and talking about saving energy. Um, and while it's through low and no cost opportunities, it's definitely also without sacrificing water quality. So the agenda for what we're gonna cover today is strategic energy management. What does that mean? Um, talk about the success at the Verdon Water Reclamation Center and then talk about success at some other BC Hydro strategic energy management participant sites. Then I wanna just throw out some more project ideas to you um, that folks have implemented, some typical low, no cost opportunities that um, folks have found success with. And then just kind of close out with a summary. And I hope that throughout the presentation, you can ask questions. I hope that you'll be coming up with ideas for your own systems. Um, for your own treatment plans, thinking about, well, could we turn this off? Or, you know, just kind of taking notes about any ideas that come up um, throughout. And feel free to share those in chat as well. Um, so what is strategic energy management? Well, um, BC Hydro has a few different programs for strategic energy management for their industrial customers, and wastewater treatment plants are industrial customers. Um, so they have an energy manager program for their larger customers that are 20 gigawatt hours per year um, or higher. And then they have an industrial cohort program that's for four to 20 gigawatt hour customers. Um, and then there's also a regional energy management program for um, 0.5 to four gigawatt hour customers. And so this presentation and the BC Hydro um, cohort I'm talking about, that was through the wastewater industrial cohort that BC Hydro is sponsoring. Um, and so that really provides support through energy experts, brings together um, different wastewater treatment plants. This BC Hydro wastewater cohort has four participants in it. Um, and so we come together and share knowledge and uh, folks talk about their successes and challenges. Um, and it's all centered around low and no cost practices to save energy without sacrificing water quality. And one of the overall goals of the program is to for the staff to develop um, ideas and ways that they can manage uh, energy more efficiently for the long term. So we're not talking about um, just making something that's just gonna save energy for a few months and then someone else is gonna come and change a set point. We want um, things that you're gonna implement for the long term and uh, do the procedures and updates to make sure that those savings can persist in the future when you move on to a different role or someone else, you know, there's new people working on it that everyone understands the good changes that are made and takes those forward. And so three big components of strategic energy management are the knowledge, the support, and the tools that all together lead to the energy savings. And so I mentioned um, bringing in experts and sharing knowledge. So that's coming in and saying, you know, other plants have tried this and this has worked and they've been able to save energy coming in and, uh, and asking folks questions and just helping them really think in a new way because um, obviously you want to meet permit and your goal is to produce a certain quality effluent, right? And so 
energy a lot of times isn't even talked about or people don't know, they've never even seen energy bills. And so it hasn't been a big part of the conversation for a lot of wastewater folks. And so uh, going through strategic energy management kind of gets energy on the table. It's never gonna be first priority and we don't think it should be. It just um, should be something that's thought about and incorporated into what you're doing so that you can meet the needs of your customers as efficiently as possible. Um, and then the support is uh, with you know, folks coming in and helping identify energy saving opportunities and then helping folks understand, well, um, is this, how much energy savings potential is, is there? Is it gonna take um, a small effort and we're gonna save a small amount of energy, which is great, and you do a bunch of those, you're gonna see an impact? Um, or is it something that is gonna save a lot of energy and not take very much effort, then in that case, that's something you definitely wanna work on because um, you're gonna get the most uh, savings for the least amount of effort. And then other things might turn out to, you know, take a lot of effort and not have very much energy savings. So it's probably not worth pursuing those. And then um, of course, throughout it, while strategic energy management is focused on low and no cost opportunities, capital ideas always come up. And that level of what is a capital project for facilities varies because, um, you know, it kind of depends on your budget. And so putting a VFD on a 10 horsepower pump might not be a capital project for you, that might be something you can do quickly and easily, but for another system, that might be a, a big effort item. So, um, you know, meeting folks where their needs are at the level that they're at is really um, a goal of strategic energy management as well. Um, and there's tools, and so folks that are participating in a big program like this, there's an energy model that's developed, and so that looks at their site energy use over a uh, baseline year, and then uh, as energy savings opportunities are implemented, people complete projects, then you can start to see the energy savings versus what their energy use would have been if they didn't um, do any energy savings ideas, implement any ideas. And so, you know, you might think, oh, it's gonna be really easy. And, and so some, for some folks it is really easy and some opportunities are easy, but as you know, your plan, every plan is different and there's some things that are a little more challenging or sometimes it's um, the organizational change because since energy is not necessarily on the radar, sometimes you're having to really work with folks to get buy-in and say, we should do this. We can still operate and meet our water quality, meet our permit, um, but we can do it in a better way and be more uh, optimized. Uh, and so it depends on folks' level of risk. And so sometimes it's, it's a little more of a process, um, a little more winding route to get there to be, you know, a fully optimized plant. Uh, I do, I, I, I live in the state of Idaho and I do a lot of work with Idaho Power, who is the power provider for a lot of the state. And they did a cohort with um, 12 wastewater facilities back in 20, that started in 2014. Um, there was a lot of success there. So they published a success brochure and I really like a quote from McMummer at the city of Ketchum. He says, the level of treatment wasn't affected, but we reduced our energy consumption for that process by about 15%. And so you're probably getting that this is a theme that I'm saying you can save energy and optimize your process and you're not sacrificing your water quality for that. Um, you're not sacrificing your level of treatment. And so that's just really powerful message to take away there that you, you can implement changes and, and be successful in that without risking your permit. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the success that the Vernon Water Reclamation Center had. Uh, if you're not familiar with Vernon, um, it was, the plant was commissioned in December of 2004 and their flow is uh, 12,600 cubic meters per day or about 4,500 megaliters per year. And their BOD loading is, is higher than um, some folks may have because they do have a brewery that discharges. So their BOD loading is um, 585 milligrams per liter on average. And um, they're a BNR plant and their staff buy-in to strategic energy management has really been huge. Um, they're just a great facility to work with. They uh, were already operating really well and, and had already optimized a lot, but still came in uh, really enthusiastic and wanting to learn about other potential opportunities and really 
um, looking at their plant with fresh eyes and trying to, you know, throw out all potential ideas for how they could operate even better than they already were. Uh, so their plant, the effluent, typically goes to spray irrigation. They have a big reservoir that they have to pump up to, and then that's used for golf courses, ranches, farms, seed orchards, and sports fields. And then they also have an option in, um, if they need to, they can do a lake release. Uh, Vernon's in a very beautiful area, and they can treat more. They have sand filters and UV, and so if they're going to the um, Okanagan Lake, then they, they do additional treatment for that, additional testing. And that has a deep lake outfall that's gravity. And so um, there's a huge, there's significantly less energy when they're going to the lake. Um, but that's, that was on an as needed basis. And that was this year, the reservoir was full. So they did, did go to the lake. Um, and they also do actually treat with the, um, do additional treatment when they're going to a golf course for, for reuse and they did have some energy savings um, for when they're um, sending the water to the golf course. So Vernon's goal for, um, they made a commitment to energy efficiency and so they kind of really took some of the themes of strategic energy management and incorporated those into their goal. They said to continue to do energy projects, to measure and improve, to get involved, to make a commitment to question assumptions, to do it right the first time, to fix the leaks, and to make it a habit. Uh, and I really just like their commitment there because it just covers so many, so many good points. Um, and so those are really good things for you to think about for, for your system. Um, when, you, when you implement something, it, you wanna just do it a little bit and see how it works. And then if it's working well with that small change, then you make another small change. And I'm gonna have a few more examples throughout that just kind of talk about that. But when I'm talking about the changes that folks are making to save energy, it's never a big change. It's never going, if your DO set points three milligrams per liter, it's not, okay, let's try two milligrams per liter. It's let's try 2.9 or 2.8 milligrams per liter. See how that goes, you know, let it run for a week or, and then, and then if it's going well, go a little lower until you hit a point where you feel like it's affecting your treatment negatively, then go back up to what was working well. Um, and so that, that's really a big part of all these low, no cost changes that folks are making. They're doing it on a trial. They're not just, you don't, you, you, you all know, <laughs> you don't wanna, you don't wanna do anything risky. And so yeah, it's, it's small changes that add up to big impact and big savings for your facility. And then making a habit is making sure that that um, energy savings goes into the future and that five years from now, great changes you made that are still applicable are still happening. It's not that, oh yeah, this one summer we did this great change and then you forget about it the next summer. It's making sure that, that that's all um, integrated into what you're doing. And that's really what Vernon, Vernon um, does well with what they're doing is, is making it a habit too. So they've done some completed projects. So they were able to shut off their foul air system for their primary clarifiers. Um, I had the pleasure of going out there last summer and uh, when we were doing the plant walkthrough, uh, they, they happened to have their odor control off um, be, for a repair and there was no odors. And so that's just part of asking why. When you're at your plant, you think, okay, well, if we're operating differently and it's it's more efficient, can we operate this way all the time? And so that was the question. Well, if, if the blower's off and it, there's no odor, does it need to be running? And they were typically running it for six months a year. And so they decided to leave it off uh, last year for that last you know month and a half, they would have normally had it on, no issues. And then, you know, the operators are walking around every day. So that was the plan, right? Leave it off. And then if we notice any odors, we'll turn it back on. Or if we get any odor complaints, we'll turn it back on. But hopefully, you know, the, the thought was that the operators would notice it before an odor complaint came in and they had no odor issues, no, no odor complaints. And then this year, they never even turned it back on. So that was a 40 horsepower blower that's not running for six months. And so that savings to them is $1,200 a month that they can then spend on other things besides energy. So that, that's a great thing they did. And then it's still there if they need to turn it on, if they do notice any odor issues. 
And then they also optimized um, their primary treatment. They reduced their primary sludge pump times by 50%. And so for this one, their primary sludge pumps were cycling for 20 minutes an hour. And so, you know, whenever we're asked, talking to treatment plants and saying, okay, well, how are you operating? So you're doing 20 minutes. Well, how did you decide on 20 minutes? Um, what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? And, and then, you know, folks start thinking about it. And usually um, there's some flexibility in there that's, you know, a safe change they can make. And so Vernon found that they were actually able to reduce that by half and um, had no issues. And so they've, they've saved energy that way with no impact, no negative impact to their treatment. And then they also were able to reduce their secondary foam pit um, pump run time. And so um, they also reduce the water use going to that pit. And so they want to keep the foam down, but they had more water going than needed to. So they turned that down a little bit. Um, they turned it down to just the minimum that they needed there. And then for the run times, uh, it was um, cycling off for 17 minutes. And so then they thought, okay, well, how could we cycle it off for longer every every cycle. And so instead of doing a 17 minute cycle, they did a 31 minute cycle. And again, no issues. The the scum, when, when the pump runs, it's still running for four to five minutes to just bring the level down to set point, but it's running less frequently. And so they reduced that um, run time by 50%. That's a small pump, but little changes like that just add up. And if you don't need to run it as much, then um, you can save by not doing it, and then you're just providing an even better service to your customers. Another uh, project they did was reducing their effluent water use. So a lot of treatment plants have reuse water where you're reusing your effluent. Um, I'll call it non-potable water later in the, in the presentation, but um, Vernon found they could shut off the water to their centrate tank when their centrifuge wasn't running. They don't run their centrifuge 24 seven, and so um, just found that was an easy thing to use less water on. And then decrease the spraying of the bioreactors. Very common that um, folks at treatment plants are just using more water. There's a, a bit of a misconception at some facilities uh, that re, uh, this reuse water, non-potable water is free, but you're, you know, you're paying to pump it around and you already treated it and then you're um, gonna treat it again by using it. So uh, it does add cost for it. So it's a very common uh, energy saving opportunity at facilities and Vernon did have a little bit that they could cut back on with their, their water use. And then just made staff more aware of it because again, it's just a, not something that folks really think about too much that that cost of using the water because it's readily available at a lot of plants. And so just kind of um, awareness and Vernon's been great about um, really sharing out everything they're doing, getting all the staff involved in um, knowing about what's going on, asking questions and, and um, yeah, being excited about saving energy while just producing great effluent. And then they were getting a new hot water heater. And so it was gonna be an electric hot water heater. And they looked at it and saw how much energy that was gonna use. It wasn't very efficient. And so they opted to get a natural gas uh, water heater instead. And so that's a common thing we, we see with strategic energy management. And when, when folks start thinking about energy and how much energy different processes and equipment is using, folks start to ask good questions about, well, is this the most efficient piece of equipment we could get? Is there, you know, what else is out there? That, or is there another option that's slightly more efficient? And so it leads into thoughts for your capital project program and um, good changes overall, because you know, in general, you have to meet, wastewater plants are designed to meet future loads and peak demand. And so there, you've gotta be able to meet that worst case scenario. And so a lot of times um, equipment has to be bigger to do that, which is understandable, but then you also wanna operate efficiently now with what you have. And so um, just thinking about energy kinda can help you op operate better for your process as well. The last thing I wanted to mention that Vernon did was they reduced their dissolved oxygen set points and their, their DO set points were already um, low um, 
Well, so they have four zones and they were ranging from two milligrams per liter down to 0.6 in the last cell. And so, um, you know, that's already good, but they were able to actually go lower. So in three cells, they wanted to fine tune their BNR process and um, to help reduce their phosphorus concentrations in the effluent, they, they trialed going even lower with their DO levels. And so they were able to go down by 0.4 to 0.5 milligrams per liter. So instead of two milligrams per liter in that first cell, they were able to go down to 1.6. And then um, in the second one, they were able to go from 1.9 to 1.4. So they didn't change the last one. They're still at 0.6 milligrams per liter, but just the fact that they were already at two and below and then you know, we're willing to think about it and try to go a little lower and see how their process changed or improved. And they're actually um, feel like they're operating great right now. So saving energy, operating really well. Um, yeah, just a, a great success story. Then I wanted to mention um, some other DC Hydro Cohort SEM project, low, no cost that folks have implemented to just kind of give you more ideas. And I guess this is a, a good time if no one's posting in chat, maybe if you've um, tried something that I've already mentioned, maybe share that out with your peers. Or if you uh, hear something that sounds like something that might work at your plant, then, then share that out with folks. So one facility did a lighting upgrade and there's still quite a bit of lighting out there in the world that hasn't been upgraded to LEDs. And so if you've got a gallery or you've got somewhere that has lighting that, that's um, high pressure sodium or, or inefficient or lights that are, you know, fluorescents that are on all the time, definitely consider a lighting upgrade. For this facility, they replaced 50 P8 32 watt bulbs with 15 watt LED tubes. So that's 7,000 kilowatt hours they saved. And then they're changing 54 watt lights to half the wattage. And so overall for their lighting upgrade project, um, the total savings is 57,000 kilowatt hours a year. And I'm guessing you probably don't think in kilowatt hours. You probably think in dollars. And so what does that mean? Well, an average rate for BC Hydro is about six cents per kilowatt hour. And so just using that, um, we're multiplying kilowatt hours per year by six cents per kilowatt hour. And so the kilowatt hours cancel, we're in dollars per year, and it's $3,420 a year of savings from um, upgrading the lighting. And then they did some other optimizations as well. And so for HVAC, they had some um, glycol pumps that were part of their heating system for HVAC, and they were running all summer. And so those didn't need to be running when it's hot out. <laughs> and so even though they're small quarter horsepower pumps, they have quite a bit, quite a few of them. And so just kind of turning them off for the summer because they don't need to be on, saves some energy, right? And then they're doing some exterior lighting upgrades. And so their system, um, it's a little bit sophisticated. So it has timers that can be set for what, when the lights are on and so they just adjusted the timer settings for their street and building exterior lights. They have a lot of exterior lights. And so just, just having them just be on when it's dark um, saves some energy. There's a lot of um, places that have photo cells or maybe you have exterior lighting that could use photo cells just to make it easier. Um, or if you have failed photo cells, then your exterior lights are on all the time. That's something you could fix to save energy as well. Uh, and this one, they also had some, some equipment they weren't using at all. It's out of service and the VFDs were still powered up. And so they just um, turned off the power to those to save a little bit of energy. And another um, uh, project that was done by a cohort participant, which is a great one for folks with compressed air, because compressed air is inherently inefficient. A lot of the energy that's used to produce compressed air actually goes to heat and so um, it, it's only about 15% efficient to use a high pressure air. And so if, you, if you've got leaks, those are great to find those leaks and repair them. And so this facility did an air leak survey. And so they found 38 leaks uh, with sonic testing. And then they went back and um, 
if you don't have a leak detector, you can just take, you know, soapy water and go and find them. You can listen. If you, if you don't already go through your plant and listen for compressed air leaks, start listening for them and fixing them. Um, so they confirmed it that way. And then they also, um, Fluke came out, a Fluke rep came out and demonstrated a, a more expensive high-tech piece of equipment that can, can identify leaks, uh, especially in noisy areas. And so this is just a an image that's showing the leak. And so it's, it's identifying where that leak's coming from. And so uh, they issued a work order and, and got those the bigger leaks fixed, the major leaks. And then, you know, there's some small ones they identified that, that might not get fixed because it's, it's uh, more work to fix those. And so you might not be able to fix everything you find, but if you, if you, fix, if you fix what you can, then, then you're on the right track to saving energy. Um, using less compressed air unnecessarily. So they made the repairs. Oh, and their annual savings for this was estimated to be $3,850. So that's great savings. Another uh, participant was able to increase their influ influent wet well level. This is another very common um, opportunity at wastewater plants. Uh, sometimes the wet well levels are designed at one point and then maybe they get conservatively set at a different point that's lower. And so when you have the wet well level set point lower, you're putting more head on your pump. Your pump has to provide more head to get the fluid, right? So if you raise the wet well level, that's less head on your pump. And there's a lot of pumps at wastewater plants that are low head, high flow pumps. And so you can get good savings just from raising a wet well level. So for this uh, BC Hydro participant, they found they could seasonally raise the wet well level. And um, I definitely encourage you to not think, oh, I can only make this change for the whole year. Think about like, maybe I can make this change seasonally and it would work well for my plant. So for them, they were able to raise it 30 centimeters during the warmer half of the year. And then um, half of that, so 15 centimeters during the colder half of the year. So the annual, annual energy savings for that, 35,000 kilowatt hours, which is $2,100. So um, again, $2,100 to spend on something besides energy uh, just to be more optimized. And no negative impacts on process. Uh, and just this, this slide is just an example of kind of coming at your plant with fresh eyes. So you're looking at this and what do you see that you know, maybe could be optimized. And so let's take a look. So something that definitely comes up frequently is heating set points and so if you're, and cooling. So if you're using electricity or even if you're using natural gas and wanna save natural gas, if, if you have rooms that are set for human comfort, then think about, well, if folks are only in and out of there on their rounds, what, what does the equipment need? And so oftentimes we find that rooms are set for human comfort, you know, it's nice and 65, well, I'm going to say Fahrenheit because I'm in the States, but, <laughs> you know, it's nice and cool to go into in the summertime, but could the equipment handle it being significantly warmer? And so um, that can be, the cost can be really surprising to folks from just heating and cooling costs for rooms. And so definitely encourage you to go back and look at your different buildings and, and what the set points are. And hopefully you have um, thermostats that actually have numbers on them. <laughs> and hopefully you have programmable ones that you can uh, program that maybe you do have something that needs, you know, folks are in it frequently during the day, but nights and weekends, you could, you could adjust those. And so if you've got programmable thermostats where you can can really fine tune that, then, then you can save energy that way. Here's lighting again. They've got some T5 lights in there that they could upgrade to LEDs. They've got an uninsulated door in there. And so, um, you know, maybe in the wintertime, that's good because the, the sun shines on it. But um, insulation is something to think about that can help with your HVAC costs. If you've got places um, that can use some, some better insulation, or even if it means in the winter time, um, you know, sticking a piece of foam somewhere to help, then, then that's an option that some folks do. And then pumps, just keep in mind this is more capital, but as you 
have equipment that fails that needs replacement or that's just at the end of its useful life that you're upgrading, really think about efficiency. There's um, super efficient motors out there now. And so um, when you're making upgrades, really just kind of take a harder look at, at, at efficiency. All right, now I wanted to talk about energy savings and non-potable water systems. I, I mentioned this earlier. So this is reusing your plant effluent um, water. And so this is a real picture. It says it's free, leave the wash water in hand. And so as I, as I said earlier, it's really not free. It's just kind of a misconception some places um, and, and really just because energy is not really a big part of, of what you're doing, right? It's not, or may, maybe at your plant it is, but for most folks it's not. And so um, it's very common to see water spraying on water. There's, you know, a nozzle that's kind of not working as well. And does this spray bar even need to be on at all right now? You know, what, what are you trying to do? And does the water need to be running? And does it need to be running at the pressure it's running at? So let's look at a few examples. So what's the cost for running um, the four sprays on four clarifiers all the time. So 24 seven running, 52,000 kilowatt hours for that. And so $4,200 a year to spray water on water. So th these folks installed uh, solenoids on their spray bars so they could have them um, cycling. And so each one's running 15 minutes. So this first one's running for the first 15 minutes of an hour. The one on the top right is running for the next 15 minutes, and then so on, right? So each clarifier spray bar is only running for 15 minutes an hour, and so it's staggered. Only one at a time is on, and so you're cutting that water use by a quarter. So 52,000 times a quarter of that is only 13,000 kilowatt hours that's being used now. For this project, or so the savings there was costing $4,200. And then now it's um, only 25% of that, so it's costing only $1,000. And then for them, it only cost them $1,000 in parts and time, plus time. So, you know, not an expensive project that's, you know, low cost and, you know, saving $3,000 a year. So it's <laughs> that's a very quick payback on that project. And then in this case, they did get incentive money from their utility for that. And then reducing pressure is, is one that comes up all the time <laughs> in wastewater treatment plants. Um, I have the pleasure of um, doing a lot of virtual treasure hunts these days where I go to a wastewater plant and we, we just go through their whole system and talk about, well, what can you do? How can you save energy? You know, what are your set points? And just um, this definitely comes up a lot. So if you have a higher pressure, you are not alone. <laughs> Oh, so this participant, um, they were running their non-potable system at 85. That's their pressure set point. And so they're participating in strategic energy management. They're thinking, what can we do to save energy? And so they thought, oh, well, the rest of our processes really only need 60. We just have this one process that needs 85. So maybe we'll put in a booster station. And, and, and that, that could save energy for sure, but that's not necessarily a low cost option to put in a booster station. And so um, that, that was the original solution to drop their current system to 60 PSI um, and then put in that booster station for, the, for that other process. But then just asking why, well, why, why, do you wanna, why do you need 85? What's the process that needs that? And, and just asking questions and kind of digging into um, what you're trying to do and what the goal is. And so it turns out they just needed 85 PSI for two hours a day for their grit washer. And so knowing that uh, um, SEM's, you know, low, no cost solution to that is really, well, can your system handle just dropping your pressure as low as you can with the pumps you have currently um, for 22 hours a day? And so they, were successful with that. They tried it out um, and it was implemented in steps. Like, like I mentioned, you know, so they, they read 85, they dropped it to 80, they ran that way for a week uh, successfully. And then they said, okay, let's go down to 75. They went down to 75 for a week and um, all was operating fine. They just would go up to the higher pressure for uh, two hours a day and, and they're successful with
with that, which is great. And their pumps are limited, so they can't go all the way down to 60 like they could um, if they were putting in a new station. So um, you might not be able to go as far as you want to go with energy savings, but hopefully you can make some changes that are saving without having any negative impacts and without having to buy all new equipment. We want you to save energy through using the equipment that you already have or finding some low cost solutions. Here's another example. Uh, this, this facility is doing nitrification and denitrification and they were an Idaho Power Strategic Energy Management participant and so they looked at cycling their blowers. And um, this scares some people. <laughs> <laughs> but there's definitely plants out there that uh, are not doing BNR that are able to successfully cycle their either their blowers or their surface aerators. Um, sometimes they're cycling them. This facility was doing it throughout the day. There's other facilities where maybe they're doing it, you know, shutting off surface aerators for two hours every night. So th there's a lot of variations out there where folks have been successful with their treatment and saving a lot of energy. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's helping denitrification. So for this facility, they had three 150 horsepower blowers, uh, annual energy use about 2.5 million kilowatt hours. And so what they found, and I'm sure you can guess that they didn't just come up with, uh, oh, 102 minutes right off the bat, right? This is, you know, trial, try it, try it, see what works. And they found in the winter, 102 minutes on, 102 minutes off, worked well. They found in the summer that was 74 minutes on and 133 minutes off. And so what that meant to them was 1.4 million kilowatt hours per year in energy savings and uh, $70,000 a year. So good energy savings uh, and no negative impacts on treatment. Another example is uh, reducing digester mixing. So they have VFDs on their recirculation pumps and their digesters. And so um, two digesters, two 40 horsepower pumps, and they are running rapid mix, so full speed, two hours a day, and reduced speed, 75%, for 22 hours a day. And centrifugal pumps, if you go down by 25% speed, you get a bonus for power. It actually goes down closer to 50% for power use. So if you've got fans or centrifugal pumps that you can turn down with your VFDs, you can get really good energy savings. You can also get it with PD blowers, but um, it's, it's a one-to-one -one speed to energy for, for PD type, um, for PD blowers. The energy savings for the digester mixing, it's 175,000 kilowatt hours a year, $8,800 a year for, for that. Um, a different system was able to lower their compressed uh, air pressure and they had a de dedicated air compressor just for their UV system for sleeve wiping. And so uh, looking at it, they had that compressor set for 140 PSI, and then it was regulated down to 90. <laughs> and so the question is, well, if that's all that com air compressor is serving, wh why are you regulating it down to 90? Why aren't you just changing it so it's running at 90? Um, and so they were able to do that, and that was a 50 PSI reduction. And the rule of thumb for compressed air is that uh, savings, you save about 1% for that piece of equipment for every two PSI or 14 kilopascals that you do, that you reduce. And so for them, that's 25% reduction. So 25% savings, which was estimated to be 5,000 kilowatt hours a year. So it's not, not huge, but <laughs> it's, it's savings and just making small changes like that do add up. Uh, run less equipment, it, here's an example of a, a plant that I'm working with now that had four non, they have four non-potable water pumps, three of them were running, and so as they're looking at things with fresh eyes, they said, wait a minute, we've got three pumps running at 96% speed and we're getting hardly any flow, we don't have hardly any demand right now, and so they just realized that they should only had one pump running and they had a maintenance issue and they just um, found the pumps were plugged up and cleaned them out, and now they're operating with one pump much more efficiently. So maybe you have some equipment that's kind of, you're not really thinking about it, not really paying attention to how many pieces are running right now. I have another system I'm working with, and they had two pumps running, um, and now they're down to one pump running, I think at half speed, because same thing, something had failed, and they didn't realize it and didn't really think about it. Um, so it kind of just sometimes the stuff goes on for a long time, 
if folks aren't um, maybe thinking about it as much. All right. And then um, there's another Wendy, facility that was able we'll to... Yes? We just, um, I'm just going to interrupt you there. We've got about five minutes left, and there's quite a few questions that have trickled in. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you want to just take those now or if there's any final slides you want to run through, and then we can get to the questions, or... Um, let me just jump through to, I think I'm at my... Um, yeah, let me just do the summary, and then, yeah. So Perfect. write down your energy-saving ideas. Look at your treatment plant with fresh eyes. Contact your power provider about incentives. And I hope that you don't just like file away your notes, go back and, and implement changes to save energy and then share out your success. And yeah, I'd love to take questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Wendy. Um, we have a few, there's, there's quite a few questions and there's also a few um, success stories. So uh, I think this would be great. Um, the first one was, what was the capital cost of the lighting upgrades? So that was back kind of near, closer to the beginning. And what was the payback on that project in years? Oh, I don't have that, but I will say lighting projects typically have good paybacks now, especially if you have, when they don't have good payback, it's usually for where you're not running the lights very often. So um, you know, if you have some place where you're just going in on rounds, th th that's not going to have a good payback. But if you have a gallery that you have the lights on all the time and they're older lights, then, um, you know, it's, it's lighting projects I've usually seen are usually less than five years for sure. Great. Thanks. The next question is, um, you mentioned VFDs on a 10 horsepower pump. We have 11 duplex pump stations that range from five horsepower to 20 horsepower pumps. Would installing VFDs show a significant energy saving? Um, if you are able to run them at lower flows, so where we don't recommend VFDs because there's a 3% efficiency loss for VFDs. So if you're going to run at a constant flow, you're better off with a pump that's running efficiently at that constant flow. If you know your flows are going to be variable, um, then yeah, a VFD on a centrifugal pump is definitely going to save you energy. It's just where you're in a situation where you're operating at full speed all the time or uh, the majority of the time, then a, then a VFD is not a, not a, probably not a good option for you in that situation. Great, thanks. Okay, the next question is, how are you accounting for seasonal or even diurnal flows when optimizing energy conservation? Are you measuring over the course of the months before making changes or relying on historical data that the plant has collected? Uh, so for the plants that are part of a strategic energy management program that have an energy model, uh, if it's a daily model, then it's based on looking at usually the most recent year of data. And so it's finding the energy drivers in there. And so it's taking the total plant energy use and um, using that for model. And sometimes flow is a, is a variable. Um, sometimes BOD ends up being a variable. It depends on the plant. Um, not all, every plant has a different uh, energy model. And so, um, yeah, it definitely accounts for seasonal differences. For capital projects, when we're looking at it, yeah, you do still have to look at seasonal difference. Um, yeah, and the diurnal flows are gonna come into, into play. And um, yeah, so it's not just, it's, it's not just looking at one point in time because that doesn't really work well with wastewater. Great, thanks. And then we just got a couple of kind of c comments, success stories, I Great. guess, from some of our operators. So um, our plant changed the set point of the effluent discharge pumps. Consequently, we discovered the effluent will discharge without any pumping at all, utilizing gravity. A 100 horsepower pump, which was pumping 24 hours a day, was no longer used every day. Huge savings. That is awesome. Um, the next one is, we were able to increase the wet well set point on our final effluent tank to push more water out by gravity instead of using the final effluent turbines. Pumps almost never run now. Um, great. And then finally, uh, sink motor controllers for your blowers also works great. Awesome. Yeah, so that's all the questions that I have here. Um, at the uh, on the chat function. Uh, I haven't seen any come in via email, but of course, uh, everybody who's tuned in, if you have other questions, um, please feel free to send them to us via email. We'll make sure that Wendy gets them and gets um, a reply back to you. Um, so thanks, Wendy, so much. I'm gonna pass it back over to Jim here um, to kind of close out our session today. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, thank you Wendy. Um, EOCP thanks you for uh, the presentation. Uh, it, was, uh, it was educational, and uh, judging by the uh, chat lines, uh, there's people that were listening and interested, so that's good. Yeah, fantastic.